Welcome to the homework tutorial for Unit 1. This first homework tutorial video will serve to spell out how we're going to be doing the homework in this course. And then uh, it's a pretty simple assignment for Unit 1, but I will give you some pointers for uh, some of the problems. And also we will kind of dip our feet into the shallow end of Excel, as it were. We'll be doing most of the problems in Excel on forthcoming homework, so start getting used to doing things in Excel. So I'll give you some examples of how to do some of the more complicated ones, but all the problems in this assignment are pretty simple, so shouldn't be too intimidating. Okay, let's jump into Excel, and I'll show you a couple things first before I give you some pointers on a few of these problems. I will always lay out all the problems we're doing across the bottom. Each one will be its own tab in Excel, so you can click through. And um, now, in Unit 1, I've assigned some problems which are just written response, and if there's ever a written response, I will give you a text box, and all you'll need to do is insert your answer into the text box and that's, what, that's where I'll be looking for it. So notice here that this is review question 8, I always give you the page reference. Okay, Then problem 2.1, it's got two parts A and B, it's strictly written answer. Uh, problem 2.2. Two, two. Problem 2.2 two, two is a true false, so I'll just let you enter. You can just put T or true in here or F. So not like that though, let's see, true false, etc. So just go ahead and on these ones, now I'm not going to give you any pointers because you just have to read the book, watch the lecture, and think them through. But on thanks now, okay, problem 2.5, I will give you an example for a lot of these problems. And in fact, in, in later homeworks, I will assign two problems and one of them, <coughs> one of them I will work through entirely in the tutorial video and then you'll be able to do that with me. And then the similar problem will be for you to do on your own and I will indicate which ones we do together which ones we do on your own in the assignment itself um, go ahead and do all of them because they're all assigned and I'm just walking you through in the tutorial video doing the, the together one so you will get all the points for that one easily just by watching the tutorial video and doing it along with me I also recommend if possible to have a two screen setup where you can maybe have two different computers or two screens on one computer have YouTube with these tutorial videos in one screen and then have Excel the Excel homework file open in the other screen and you can work back and forth you also of course want to have your textbook open on your desk so you can refer to the details of each problem or question from the book okay so with all that being said, we can uh, I can give you a few pointers or a few examples on some of these remaining Unit 1 problems. This one right here is about bonds, and the, exam the example I made up is almost exactly the same as the book problem. It says, Fast Eddie's Parts World issued 100 million bonds recently. The bonds had a face value of 1,000 each and came with a promise to pay the bearer $72.50 per year in interest for the life of the bond. What is the coupon interest rate of these bonds? So. Having read the book and looked at the lecture videos, you'll know that coupon rate is the coupon payment divided by the face value or par value. So uh, mathematically, this is really easy to do in Excel. We're just going to enter the coupon payment, 72.5, divided by the par value, 1,000. And we want, we want to display that in Excel as a percent with enough decimals to capture the detail. So notice if I go to another one, it's just a zero. So I'll, I'll just leave it at two decimals, so 7.25%. Yeah, that's your example. You can see exactly how I did that, and then you can apply that right here to the one from the book. Notice also that in these um, math type problems, I will always put the answer boxes or things where you should enter uh, data and or calculations or answers in highlighted and outlined cells. So when I go through to grade, I'm looking at the highlighted cells to see if you've put the appropriate thing in there. Okay, so problem 2.6, similar situation. It gives you some details of different components of an interest rate and I'll, I've gone ahead here and I'm, I've been being really nice to you in these earlier assignments and giving you the equation for the nominal interest rate. The nominal interest rate I equals R, the real interest rate, plus pi, expected inflation, plus DR, default risk, plus LR, liquidity risk, plus MR, maturity risk. So the way we want to do this in Excel is just plug numbers in and then have Excel calc do the calculation for us. It's, e it's easy math but we might as well have Excel do it. That way we won't make mistakes and then we can just replicate it. So I, I do all my math in Excel pretty much. So I want to uh, make this nominal interest rate a function of the sum of everything down below here. And then we, once we do that and then copy it over here and let's format it as percent. 
with two decimals, then all we need to do is plug in the details in these cells here. So I'll make up some numbers for right now, then you can plug the ones in from the book over here, having replicated this process. So let's say the real interest rate is uh, 1%, the expected inflation rate is 2%, and uh, we've got to display these as a percent, by the way, so that should be 0, 1, 0, 2. Um, let's say default risk in this situation is um, is one half of 1%, 0 0.005. Liquidity risk is 0 0.001. And maturity risk is 0 0.02. So that gives us a total interest rate of 5.6. Let's just uh, format everything as percent here. Now, if you've got stuff formatted as percent, Excel treats it as percentage points, so you don't have to enter point one; you just enter one. If you don't have it formatted as percent, note that if you enter one, Excel is going to treat that as 100%. So be careful on your formatting there. Go ahead and put that back as uh, percent, and then just delete it for you. Okay, so I'll highlight those two. So easy to change things around here in Excel and then run multiple scenarios. You know, if I wanted to do it, you don't have to do this, but if I want to do even one more scenario, I could just copy and paste there and then change the values over here accordingly. So you see how easy that is to replicate things and run different scenarios within Excel. All right, problem 2-7. This is asking you to uh, construct a treasury yield curve and it's got a built-in chart in Excel, which is programmed to enter the, which is programmed to to plot the points you enter here. Now, what I want you to do, the book says, just plug in these values. And I'll go ahead and plug these values in. But what I'm going to assign you to do is go and enter the date on which you do the assignment. So I'm recording this on uh, November 12th, 2017, and go to a financial data source online such as Wall Street Journal and we'll go ahead and click through to the rates and there's several different sources you can use just find one that has the the current whenever you're doing this assignment interest rates in the Wall Street Journal you want to click on the market data and then you want to click on rates and then we're going to want to scroll down here's uh, government bond interest rates okay and I just realized that the Wall Street Journal actually doesn't have uh, it doesn't report data on that page for every single category of bills and bonds here, so uh, no worries. I just went to Bloomberg, a little more comprehensive data source, and I uh, actually just Googled Bloomberg U.S. Treasury uh, bill yields, and uh, here we go. So I can have both of these windows open. So I just plug in my yield 1.22 for the three month. There's my six month 1.36 my one year or 12 month is 1.53 and my two year 1.65 my three year we'll just skip three year because uh, even Bloomberg's not reporting that five year 2.05 10 year 2.40 and 30 year 2.88 so there's my yield curve for right now. Okay, so this is a nice little automatic chart function. All I gotta do is plug the data in. So there's that one. Now, of course, you're gonna be doing this on the date in question in the actual class. So that'll be pretty easy for you. And I'll familiarize you with uh, financial news sites too. Okay, finally, problem 3.2. And it says, Assume that Goodfellows National Bank pays 5% interest on depositors' accounts and charges 10% interest on loans it makes to businesses. What is Goodfellows' interest rate spread? Well, uh, you can work that one over here where it says book problem. I'll, I'll work something kind of similar. Let's say the borrow rate, that, let's, let's make this a little more up to date. Let's say the borrowing rate is 1%. We want to enter that as 0 0.01. And the lending rate is, oh, let's say the, uh, this bank does mostly mortgages and they're making those at 4.5%, uh, 0.045 show these as percent and then the rate spread is simply the rate they're lending minus the rate they're borrowing by the way notice that I state that uh, the banks 
The deposit rate is a borrow rate because banks are borrowing deposits from their deposit customers in order to relend them. Remember, financial intermediation, borrowing to relend. So there's our rate spread right there. Okay, now the uh, book problem gets a little more complicated in part B. It says that was too simple to make it more challenging. Assume that there's a different rate for the passbooks, which are kind of the um, the savings accounts that you can go and, and tap any time, and then the CDs, the certificates of deposit, which have a fixed uh, maturity to them. So the book gives you certain data, and you, you'll be able to run this whole thing over here. I'll just make up some, some similar data over here. Let's say passbook rates, again, are... Uh, let's do 1.35. I think that's the, the about the highest current savings rate being paid right now. I just looked that up on bank rate. And let's say CDs are paying, oh, let's say 0 0.025. And let's say that passbook or the savings account are... 70% uh, of those banks' deposits and CDs are the remaining 30%. And again, we'll format all of that as percents and show the appropriate number of decimals. Now, the borrow rate isn't just the simple average of these two. Now, if these were 50-50, it would be, but they're not. So we're going to have to take a weighted average. And to do that, I'm going to take the product of this passbook rate times its weight in their uh, liabilities portfolio and then add the product of the CD rate times its weight which is 30 percent in the portfolio and there's my weighted average now of these two rates and you, that tilts you know towards the lower rate because the lower rate for the passbooks is a bigger chunk of the deposit source okay then let's say and then the, the question goes on to say the um, They've got two different lend rates, one for short-term loans and one for long-term loans. And this this is realistic. It's just really simplified. In reality, a, a bank's going to have you know several different borrowing rates depend on these savings vehicles, um, and then several different lending rates for all sorts of different loans, and then for the risk profile of the borrowers within each loan category. So they might they might have dozens of different lending rates actually. But you know, we get the idea. Of, I'm just keeping it pretty simple here. So. Uh, let's say the rate on short-term loans is 4%, 0 0.04, and the rate on long-term loans is, um, let's just say 6%, 0 0.06. And once again, now I want to actually make this say percent of loans. And what percent of loans are the short-term loans? Let's just say that these are 65%. Um, and the long-term loans would be the remaining 35%. So once again, format this as percent with the proper number of decimal spaces. And then we could do the same thing here, which is just uh, the, the pro product of these two times the product of these two. Same formula for weighted average. Uh, you know, we could also just do a sum product function, which is just kind of a little quicker way to do the what we did up here with this times this plus this times this. And this time we're going to go arrange things by vertical array. So it's going to take everything in this vertical array here and then multiply each item by the corresponding entry in this vertical array. So actually what this is doing is going to take 4% times 65% and then add 6% plus 35%. So that's just a, that's another uh, fancy Excel function that does the same thing for you a little bit quicker. And you try, you know, try both of them and verify that you get the same result. Do you do some product up here? this array, the, the rates, and then that array, the deposits, and verify uh, once we format it and show the right number of decimals that indeed we get the exact same result there. So uh, just as a little practice with different um, Excel functions. Now the rate spread again is the, the lending rate minus the, the weighted average minus the borrowing rate so there's our rate spread, 3.0%. Okay, you do the same procedure over here for the actual data from the from the book example for problem three two. All right, and that wraps it for homework one. So uh, see you in unit two lectures, and then we'll have another tutorial for unit two homework problems. Mm -hmm.